Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, your host, and today we are in the last few days of this campaign of the municipal election. So we are trying to get as many candidates on the show before that October 18th day. So we are going to be having uh, episodes released on Saturdays and Sundays, like today. Today is Saturday, and we're releasing our episode with Ward 12 candidate counselor, council candidate for the city of Calgary, Mike Lavalley. Mike, thank you so much for doing this. Chris, how the heck are you? Excited to be here. That, I'm glad. I'm glad when people are excited to be here. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, you reached out to the show because we try to approach everyone, but I know you are inundated with a lot of requests, but we have found the time to sit down and talk. So thank you so much for doing this. Oh, you are very, very welcome. Uh, Mike has told me before the during the pre-interview that he has listened to interviews before. So he knows, he knows the very first question that is going to come out of my mouth, which is, where does your sense of duty to serve come from, Mike? Well, it, it kind of threefold. There's there's three things that sort of play into it. Uh, first of all, maybe it's in the genes a little bit. Um, back my father at one time served on council back in uh, our hometown where I grew up. Uh, he did a stint there, and uh, I take after him quite strongly. So uh, so maybe some of that got passed along. Uh, the other is that I've always had kind of, uh, geez, if you can get in and fix it you should try, you know, uh, whether it would be a, you know, a sporting group, uh, an association, you know, a, a project at work or business uh, corporation, it just, I've always found it difficult to not want to hop in there and, and, and do my best to, to try and contribute. And, and the third thing really comes from my wife. Um, she, it's just, she is a totally inspirational story. And, uh, and if I could take 60 seconds or maybe 30 seconds, I'll see. If you I can, can take as long as you want. It is your show, <laughs> your episode. Take as long as you want, Mike. <laughs> you know, everybody when they're kids, um, when you're, you know, between five and 10 years old and, and, you, and you talk as kids and what do you want to be when you grow up? And inevitably at that age, you get, you know, geez, I'd like to be a firefighter or I want to be a policeman or something like that. All those typical sort of answers that happen. And uh, ever since she was a little girl, my wife always said, you know, I want to be a doctor when I grow up. And uh, it, life happens. You, you grow up, things start happening. And sometimes it's not always in the cards uh, to make it happen what that real childhood dream was. Um, she went on, did what she could with it. She was actually a uh, uh, a first responder for more than 20 years, worked in EMS uh, as a paramedic in, in another jurisdiction, and just remembered that she always wanted to be a doctor. And, and always that's what she wanted to do was just help people. And so after that, after having a whole career as a first responder, started taking classes, went back to medical school, got her, can you imagine how hard, it's hard when you're 20 something to do it. Um, after all that, go back and do it and got her degree, went through residency and now practicing as a family doctor. Very, I get inspiration from her every second day. So, so yeah. So if, if when she came to me and she said, Mike, you got to run, <laughs> then absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> so uh, if, if anyone has listened to my show, they know that my, my line of questionings will be diverse, but also very fluid because I go by what you say. In the line of questioning with uh, your wife here for a second, did you want to be a politician when you grew up? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> to total, total transparency and honesty there. I mean, I, I guess some people do, I guess. Maybe, yeah, I'm sure there are those that grow up and they make, I mean, we there are political science studies in yep. in school. You can you can get into that, and and some of the people that have served uh, locally here ha have gone down that path. Um, no, I. Uh, <laughs> you were not in the political realm, so no, I got. No, it ask, wasn't. It, uh, I, it sort I, of evolved. We'll say. <laughs> I, I so I got to ask the follow up question then. Why now then? Why 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 does Mike want to run for council in twenty twenty one? And what is it about this year, this election cycle, that made you think to yourself, you know what, my voice needs to be on council? You know, we're going to see a lot of change um, with this election cycle. We're up to at least 10 uh, of the seats around the table that uh, are going to change. Um, it, it's kind of a pivotal moment. I don't know if we've seen this much change ever since we've gone to a 15-person council type system. 
So with all of that, there's going to be, we've had a lot of noise on council, as you know, as you know we've followed along. And, Which we'll talk about in a later on. <laughs> but, but with two thirds um, of the people that, that are going to change and the amount of change we're going to see and all the challenge that we're seeing, I mean, arguably it's the toughest time in a generation for sure to be entering into the political spectrum. So I think it's more important now that if, if somebody really feels they have something to offer and can kind of be a bit of a guiding force and, and let's kind of work sensibly through the tough times um, and, and put that voice of reason behind it. If you think you can do that, I think now is a real important time to either step up or step away. Um, and so I decided to step up now, so. What what was it? Because you talk about the vacancy, but that can't be the only reason. There has to be issues. There has to be priorities that you want to address, right? That you might think to yourself, these haven't been addressed in Ward 12. And I, I'm hoping to be that voice for the people of Ward 12 to address the issues that I'm hearing about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is a, one of the major ones that I've heard the most about from people, because I've lived in Ward 12 here for 20 years. Um, you know, Cranston 20 years ago and Ward 12 20 years ago was a very different place. That's why we've seen a lot of ward boundaries change. Um, it's been growing. It was, I don't know, maybe five square blocks when I moved here. You know, Deerfoot Trail came to a three-way stop at the end. There was no extension going south. We had one bridge across the Bow River on 22X. It, it was a very different place uh, when I first moved out here. That being said, what we've seen and what we're hearing from a lot of people, um, and it's not just Ward 12, but citywide, is some, in, uh, some issues with regards to taxation and property tax. Um, yes, there's arguments to be made that, that we're not drastically out of line with other areas of other municipalities uh, in Canada, but look at the trend. Um, we have, you know, I, I prepared a chart, you know, in the last 10 years, on average, it's up 80%. Lots of people have seen them double. We'll just use doubling kind of as rough math there. Yep. Um, now, you know, magically in election year, and I say that a little, <laughs> with a little bit of cynicism. Um, but it's true because <laughs> I've worked in municipal <laughs> government before and I know that election season comes around and two things happen. Construction happens and uh, taxes are miraculously 0% increase. Yeah, yeah, that sort of happened, didn't it? But yeah, the... Um, so this past cycle aside, uh, we've seen that doubling and, and we can't continue on that trajectory. If we do, it's going to start to have real large impacts on things like uh, housing affordability. Uh, we're, we're starting to see that creep in. It's, it's, a, it's an issue across the country right now. There are certainly municipalities uh, in Canada, uh, cities where it is worse than it is in Calgary. But that doesn't mean we can take our eye off the ball because I don't think we want to go into that area. Some of the things it, it'd be nice that if people, when they come here, like I did 25 years ago, um, uh, that they can and they want to buy their first home, maybe in the city of Calgary, we need to be able to keep that affordable. And, and, and if we don't strike and if we don't work towards that, um, we're going to start to have if we don't already, a bit of a housing affordability, especially for um, maybe a first time buyer, that younger buyer. And, you know, we're trying to attract um, young, bright minds to come to the city. That's, you know, you're, I'm sure you're going to have some questions on that going forward, but um, the that's a piece of the puzzle for sure. So um, you look at taxation, I talk fiscal responsibility when it comes to taxes um, as a term I use, but it, a lot of people might think, well, geez, it's just somebody that's grumpy that they're paying too much tax. But <laughs> we have to look at it in, in a bit of a bigger spectrum and what it means um, with the taxation and the taxes and the trends. And, and to use an overused phrase that we've heard for the last year and a half, then we need to bend that curve a little bit uh, on the tax increase. Yeah. Um, I want to, you, you talk about taxation and property taxes is the main concern that you're hearing from residents, that you're hearing from residents of Ward 12. Uh, I, I want to also ask the question, what else are you hearing from residents of Ward 12? What are the major issues that people are facing down in Ward 12? Because when I talk to candidates from across this uh, ward, from the city, I should say, you hear of diverse issues that people are facing. What are the issues that are facing the people of Ward 12 outside of taxation and property taxes? 
topics of conversation. I mean, we're talking Ward 12. For those of you that are listening to your show and maybe don't know where we are, um, maybe I'll just recap that for a second. Ward 12, we're in the deep southeast. Sorry, um, I'm just going to pause you here for a second. Okay. <laughs> My battery just died on me. <laughs> but that did not work at all. So we're just going to be two seconds here. And then I'll let you st start that question over again, if possible. Okay. Okay. I don't know what's coming through my audio. Okay. Hold, sorry about this, Mike. Okay, what what is going on now? Now, now literally my whole computer is. You know, I knew it would work. It's just taking sweet time. Okay, Mike, can yeah? Can you just talk? You're about, so busy, okay, it's Mike taking a can, toll on your equipment. Yeah, can you just talk. Exactly. There we go. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. So um, we will jump back uh, to that last question and then talk about what you are actually hearing from the people outside of taxation and property taxes. Okay. So whenever you're ready, go ahead. Okay. There's some other issues, but we're talking about Ward 12. Yes. Uh, just Ward, Ward 12. 12. Yeah. We're on a podcast. And for those of you that might not know that are tuning into Chris's uh, interview here today, Ward 12, we're in the deep Southeast part of the city. We are, you know, southernmost edge of the city, easternmost edge of the city. If you put a little sort of a rectangle in that corner, that's where we are. And if you've been following along, if you've listened to the radio, read a newspaper, done anything, what have we been talking about for years and years and years in the city? That I think I think the color's green. I think yeah. green, green something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a Kreskin. You knew where I was going with that. Um, the uh, yeah, the green one um, talked about for years and years directly impacts us. I mean, we're talking right now the current uh, construction plan phase one of the green line slated to end in Shepherd. Which, if you look at a map of Ward Twelve, it looks like it's geographically pretty much in the center uh, of the ward which it is geographically, but the northern part of Ward 12 is a, we have a lot of industrial commercial warehousing, that sort of thing. If you think of between Glen, south of Glenmore uh, and north of 130th Street, a um, lot of very commercial uh, industrial in there. And so having the green line stop north of 130th, it, it, geez, it comes close. It's almost a teaser. Uh, to, to, to the population living in Ward 12, it's not it's not quite getting there. So, it's two things about about the Green Line. One is, geez, let's get it going. Um, let's get some construction going because we've been talking about it for for so long. And there's probably some good reasons why we've been talking about it. And I have certainly some opinions on why it didn't get going sooner. Um, so, so one is let's let's get going. And then in the second phase let's do it in a way that is going to help not only Ward 12, but arguably the rest of the city in the best way in terms of making the best use of the dollars and the project and, and helping transit in total by, by bringing it south and going into Seton, which is our last neighborhood, um, before you hit the Bow River uh, going south. And uh, rather than going across the river and up Center Street to 16th Avenue, we could probably get into that later, but yeah, the, yeah. the green line, the green line is certainly a topic of conversation here, for sure. It's it, it's hard to have too many conversations with people without the green line coming up in one way, shape, or form or another. Yeah. Um, I, I I I usually don't prepare questions for the interview, but what I do do <laughs> is I research. Well, and I just want to have a conversation, and at the end of the day, I want you to lead the conversation. So what you talk about is how we're going to uh, how how the interview is going to go. But I, the one thing I do do, and I think everyone should be doing this, is I look at your website. I look at your website and I look at your priorities. There are three priorities on your website, fiscal responsibility, transparency, and respect. Yeah. These are three good things that people want to be talking about because you talk to people across the city, they want respect from their city council, they want transparency from their city council, and they want our council to be uh, fiscally responsible. When you're talking to Ward 12 residents, are these three things coming up on a regular basis or are they one-offs? No, they're coming up regularly. Um, that's where those priorities come from. 
Um, if, if you're looking to represent people, then you're looking for the issues that they are concerned about and, and they would like to hear more about. The, the, with the transparency, there's so many things that happen that we kind of learn as, as citizens of Calgary, we get it kind of after the fact. You, you, get the, you get the impression that it's sort of done now and here we've done this and what do you think about it? <laughs> well, wouldn't it be great if we had that engagement a little earlier in the process uh, and it would be a little bit more transparent? Um, it, it, it's certainly easy to pick on the, num the amount of uh, in-camera or, or the private meeting sessions. Um, I believe there's probably lots of candidates that have been, have been speaking towards that. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, right, for those of you that are just listening, yeah, the, look yeah, the, Chris's, <laughs> the look on Chris's face right now is priceless. For those of you that are just listening on a podcast and not, and not seeing the video to it, but, uh, but, but yeah, loving the look on his face. Um, you you so, would be surprised at how many people talk about in camera sessions on in an open manner without me having to pull it out of them. So <laughs> I appreciate you actually willing to talk about that. Well, and, and the other thing too is on the, the follow up question to that, not to take anything anymore. So what do you think you can do about it um, with with transparency and in camera sessions in particular? And I was just discussing this with with another candidate the other day, and where if you sit in. And the neat thing about COVID is that it really pushed forward the, um, the electronic measures for a person to sit in on a, on, a, on a city council meeting. So for the last over a year, uh, we've had greater access to actually attend the meeting. Um, we still had all the in-camera sessions, so it wasn't as transparent. It was just a little bit easier access, I guess, would be a way to put it. But if you look at the agenda, um, the, when it comes out for the... Uh, the general combined meetings of, of council, there's a spot on there for in-camera items. I mean, it's built into the agendas when you look at the agenda for the, uh, for the council meetings. And so, so one of the things is that if you're, if you're trying to address things like transparency, and certainly, as you know, we live in an information-rich world. We can find stuff out easier than any other time previous in terms of getting information so when we can't everybody gets a little bit nervous on you know how come we can't get the information on this so but if you look at those agenda items so rather than scheduling and automatically having a spot on the schedule for hey this here's the stuff we're going to talk about in private why wouldn't that be the exception instead of the default yeah that let's just have it there and then if we have an update and it, it's part way through or there's something in that update that 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 wouldn't be appropriate um, because of the sensitive nature of it to share, um, then, you know, let's leave that out or we'll have a private council meeting about that. Let's have the default be that everybody gets to see what we're talking about as the representatives rather than scheduling in private things. So that's just one of the things I think it, it, it's a bit of an attitude and the way you look at it to address it, to, to start to move that needle more towards transparency rather than the other way. And at the end of the day, as someone who's worked in a municipality before, I know that in-camera sessions are only supposed to happen for three particular reasons, land, legal, and personnel. Anything outside of that has to be open to the public and transparent. Uh, as someone who is a big uh, believer in transparency, I appreciate you talking about this openly. Greatly appreciate it, Mike. Well, thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's just something that I feel I'm passionate about myself. Um, so but anyway, go ahead. Uh, uh, along the lines of transparency, um, I, I, I know a few people in Ward 12, not a lot, but I do know a few. And I know that we have been seeing an uptick in uh, subscribers to the show audio version wise. Uh, and that was after yesterday or the, in August, we had two uh, Ward 12 candidates. So for the people of Ward 12, um, when you're talking to them, and I've talked to a few, they, I, I hear the same thing. They feel like an island upon themselves. The politician gets elected, they go off to city hall, and there's no accountability of what they're talking about at city hall and the policies and the priorities of the people of Ward 12. How do you envision being held accountable to the people of Ward 12 if elected? You know, I've heard that a lot, and you, and uh, that's part of 
you know, the green line and, and, and to bring it back in, I'm sorry to keep talking green line, but from Ward 12, it's really hard not to. <laughs> exactly. Well, plus your, your signs and your buttons are green as well. So I'm assuming there was a key thing there. <laughs> There's a little subtle hint in that <laughs> Sub subliminal messaging, but uh, uh, no, yeah, um, that we are because of where we are on, on the corner of the city. Arguably, we're the furthest from City Hall geographically. I would have to measure that out. I'm willing to be fact checked on that if somebody can <laughs> can check me out on it. But uh, if you look at a map real quick, we're the furthest out. So, so how do we address that? I think people need to have better communication and not after it's all said and done, not, not here we've come up with this plan and then people can have input on it, but it's already done and we're gonna implement it. But let's get some more feedback along the way and along the process of, hey, here's something we're considering, you know, rather than here's what we're going to do, let's, let's, here's something that we're considering, we're thinking about doing, and get some real engagement in on that, and then listen to the engagement. Um, if you go through some of the engagement processes that the city has been through over the last few years, it's almost like they're ticking off a, a box with regards to engagement. Okay, now we've done that, we can carry on. Um, I've been talking to some business people. I mentioned that it's, uh, you know, we have that large commercial uh, industrial part that's in the north part uh, of our ward. And, and uh, there's uh, some industrial uh, malls in there where people can have businesses. And I was talking to a, a couple of the business owners there and, you know, they're frustrated because there's no parking. Like people can't come and patronize their business because they've got like two stalls um, uh, available to them. And when the, when the city did a, a survey here a while back, because there, there was a, a movement and they're trying to get rid of the um, mandatory minimum amount of parking around commercial development. I'm not sure if you're aware of it or not, but th there was a process that went through there and, and there was an engagement part that was done um, with the public and with business to, for feedback on what you thought of that. And overwhelmingly, the feedback that came back, because the, the survey went out and said, well, we think there's excess parking at some of these businesses. So, so we're looking at reducing the minimum amounts to eliminate the excess parking. The feedback that came back overwhelmingly from people all over the city, and not even just in our ward, but certainly from some of the from the, some of the business owners in our ward was, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> how, many, how many times have, have you gone and said, you know, I'm pulling this, for, there's just way too much parking here. Yeah. <laughs> said by almost nobody, almost nobody. I'm saying it might've happened. Like I'm, I'm sure it must've happened at some point, but said by almost nobody uh, in that type of situation. So th that, that type of feedback, I, you know, we can have. And, and the other thing too, that, you know, I've been, I've been working on a plan and it's not quite all together yet, but it's something I'd like to see happen is that because we are so far away from, from, from City Hall here in Ward 12, you know, an idea I've been working on it and I've got some, there's some logistics and some budget things that have to be worked out to see where it could work. But an idea I'm working on is what if we had a satellite office uh, for the ward and the City Ward down here in Ward 12, you know, where, you know, if you really want to engage or if you've got some questions or there's some forms you have to submit or, or just, you know, have your concerns heard, what if we had a council office down here in Ward 12 so that you didn't have to go all the way down to City Hall because now we're going to be living through a few years of construction on Deerfoot. It's out for tender for the improvements and we don't have the green line here yet. <laughs> True. So in light of that and the difficulty of physically getting there and, 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 and making the community in Ward 12 feel like they're a little more involved, you know, it's, it's something that I'm, I'm working on and, and, and I want to explore a little bit further on that, uh, the logistics of that. So I want to talk about engagement here for a second because you brought up the word engagement and I usually don't talk about this until about 30, 40 minutes into the interview, but yet again, <laughs> this is the way I love the, I love these interviews because- I didn't mean to I throw you off. <laughs> It's not throwing me off. It's just <laughs> you are leading the conversation and I appreciate you willing to talk about these things because I don't have to pull it out of you like I have with some other people. Not, not throwing any names out there, but I'm just saying that you are being a little bit more transparent and open with your answers. So I appreciate that. Oh, Engagement. Thanks. Engagement goes along with two key aspects that you talked about in your policies on your website. Yep. Transparency and respect. Yes. 
you can engage with people, you can engage with residents from across Ward 12 every single day. You are going to hear 80,000 different opinions on 80,000 different issues. Absolutely. And it, it is hard because people want it their way. People will want things their way because they believe they, and I'm not saying they're wrong, but they have their, their rights to their own opinions. And I appreciate that. How do you engage in a very diverse city, in a very diverse ward, but also with a very diverse population and make everyone happy? It's not easy, but you go at it with respect and you have to care about what people are saying and be willing to listen to them. And that's where it starts. Um, I get similar questions to that. You know, that comes up in conversation when I'm talking to people uh, as we've been going through the campaign. And you said, I've actually used the line before, we have 80 to 90,000 people living here. We are not all going to agree. Um, there is no way that we're gonna find any one topic that we're all going to agree on but if we can have an open discussion about it um, and maybe we can learn from each other on it. So for example, maybe I'm speaking with you and I have an idea about it, but you've got some ideas about it and maybe some great ideas that I haven't heard before. You know, maybe we can learn from each other and, and move forward that way on, on, the, on some progress. And even if we maybe, what I felt and after engaging with the people of the ward, we make a decision or a vote a certain way on a certain topic that comes up at city council. And maybe you as a citizen of Ward 12 didn't agree. Well, maybe I'd have to do a better job of explaining, yes, I thought about what you said and I took that into consideration. And here's why we made the decision we did because we felt it was in the best interest of uh, the greater part of the ward of what we could do to help the most amount of people. Not, I don't want to discount at all your opinion on it, but sometimes we have to make that decision and here's why and give a really good explanation on whatever the topic is as to why they do it. Because as much as we live in an information age, I think people want to be have, make, have their opinion valued. And the best way you can show value is to listen to them, consider it, and then give them a really good explanation as to why you did what you did. And not just because, well, geez, that's what I felt like, or because it was the easy way, or, you know, this is what I went in saying I was going to do. So never mind, because I got voted in and this is what I'm going to do. You know, no, let's engage and let's, uh, let's hear some opinions and make good decisions and have good explanations as to why we made those decisions. Um, for those who have listened to my show and uh, as a big Star Trek fan, you know what this line of question is about to ask. Sometimes, as uh, I think it was Kirk said to Spock, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. Or the one. How, because while you were there to represent your ward, you also, as the next city councillor, will have to represent the city as well. You have to look at the best interest for the city while advocating for the people of Ward 12. This goes into fiscal uh, responsibility a little bit, but we're still on this respect issue. Um, I want to ask you the question, how will you deal with uh, budgetary items when a budget is presented to you and items aren't being addressed in Ward 12, but you have to look at it as the bigger picture? Ward 12 might have to go without for one budget cycle on certain roads, certain expansions, certain sidewalks, because there's more pressing priorities in Ward 4, Ward 1, Ward 8. How do you deal with that? Because as the next city councillor for Ward 12, you will have to balance that out, the needs of the city against the needs of the ward from time to time. How do you envision doing that? With transparency uh, and discussion and explanation. Absolutely. That's, I think that's the only way that you can balance those items because it's not necessarily, and, and I don't mean to be a little bit confrontational, but it's not necessarily a Ward 12 versus a city or the city versus Ward 12. It can be seen that way sometimes when we're looking at priorities with regards to 
um, development or infrastructure and budgetary items and that sort of thing. But that's almost a bit of a divisional way or divisive way of, of looking at it with the, with the us versus them. Because a lot of things that we're going to need to decide in the city um, are for the city as a whole. And when, the, and when Ward 12 does better, the city does better. And, and, and when the city does better, Ward 12 does better too. So, it, you know, as sometimes it, it's, it's easy to lose that, that perspective. The, there's a, you know, there's a lot of talk about some, some major projects or some ideas around things that are happening downtown. And, and might need to be addressed. And a lot of people, when we live out this far in Ward 12, I've had the question asked. They said, yeah, but that doesn't really affect me. Uh, I, I don't go downtown. Uh, I'm not interested in that. I don't work downtown. Um, you know, so, so why are we talking about downtown? But it, it, it does, if, if you go a little bit further in the analysis, that if we can improve that part of the city and, and some of the things that, that, that we'd like to address there, it, it is a major part of the city. And, and I talked about those, you know, those taxes. And, and if we're busy downtown and if we've got corporations and businesses and everything moving to here, and if they relocate downtown, if that improves our tax situation, yeah, it does affect Ward 12 because maybe we can bend that tax curve and we aren't going to see that doubling in the next 10 years. And, and if your taxes stay stable because of something we've done in another part of the city, it actually did help you, us here in Ward 12. So it, it's looking at that bigger picture, having the conversation, the explanation that goes around with it. And you know, sort of taking away, well, let's set aside that it's an us versus them or, 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 or them versus us and back and forth. But, but how, do we, how, how do we move forward? What's better together, I guess, would be the best way to address that. And, and I appreciate you answering that because I, I want people to re remember that we are all in this together. We are electing 15 unique different people to sit around this council table. But at the end of the day, we are in this together and those 15 people will be looking after the city as along with their awards. So we are together in this, uh, uh, we are together in this and we need to make sure that people know that. So thank you for addressing it that way, Mike, greatly appreciate it. Oh, hey, no, my pleasure. It's, a, it's, a, it's an easy question to answer. You'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised, man. Um, I want to I want to transition here to fiscal responsibility. Okay. Um, before I ask you the main questions here, I want to get into and this is I, every candidate who has ever put the words fiscal responsibility on their website or in their platform. Yep. The first question out of my mouth is, what does that mean to you? That means and a lot. To me, it means being responsible or careful about the decisions we, we make with our, with our spending and our budget. Um, to a lot of people, when they hear fiscal responsibility, they hear cut, they hear slash, they hear reductions in programs because I think too often in the past, there's been too many politicians, you know, maybe those ones that wanted to be politicians when they were growing up. <laughs> just to loop back around to an earlier comment. I'm laughing internally right now for those who aren't <laughs> watching. <laughs> um, it's, you know, sometimes the phrase is used to gloss over um, a kind of a pure hack and slash kind of budget. Now, I'm not backing off on my stance that we need to be more careful about how we're spending our money. Um, taxes cannot keep going up. Um, at doubling every 10 years. It, or because if you even set that as an example, guess what? And if things get out of hand a little bit, it's going to double every six or seven years instead of 10 years, because that's the way it tends to work when you're not paying attention. The, so without keeping taking our eye off the ball that way, it, it's, it's more just being responsible in the way we spend it so that we are making the best use of, of the funds. We don't have duplication. We're, we're kind of, okay, what do we really want to have and what would kind of be nice to have? So for example, and, and I'm kind of surprised you never hit me with that question yet because on my website, I talk about, you know, must haves versus nice to haves. And, and, and a lot this of people- is the, This is the part that I was going to hit you with it. 
I'm, 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 You're I'm jumping like, ahead of me, Mike. I, I, I sensed it was coming, Chris, because I've, you know, people ask that question. What are your must-haves and what are your nice-to-haves? And I said, well, any municipality or any city, your must-haves are your basic core services. You know, you, you've got to have police protection. You know, and see where we have our own police force. We need to have, you know, roads and infrastructure and, and maintain them. And you know, and, and along with that goes our park system. Uh, and, and in our communities. And so there's a bunch of things that we need to have. We need to have garbage collection. You know, that, so, you know, we need to have water and sewer services. The, the, those are the, the must-haves. And we have to develop and build that and have a little bit of an eye to the future, see what's happening and, and, and make the, the best way around it. Um, and it's low-hanging fruit, but I have to mention it because it is such low-hanging fruit. But I, I was just... Yesterday, I was out around and I, and, and I had to, to do some, uh, take part in some things around the city. And, and, and on the same trip, I got to see the Beaufort Towers and the Blue Ring at the same time. And it, and it kind of reminded me, it was another just sort of hit me right in the face of, of things that we're doing that we're not directing our energies necessarily to things that are going to help people all the time that we say we need to do. So for example, if you look at council, um, there's been a lot of talk about affordable housing. And, and there is an issue in, in Calgary with affordable housing. It comes back to affordability that, that we just discussed a couple of minutes ago. Um, as affordability gets worse, affordable housing is certainly going to need more and more attention uh, as we go forward. So, but we focused on a percentage of our infrastructure projects being spent on public art. I like public art. Public art is neat. Um, it, it's going to happen, though, even if we don't have that infrastructure spending on public art. And I have a couple of examples there that were one really good example of that on my website. I don't know if you saw the purple dog example, but uh, uh, but I love it. And it's an iconic piece, um, certainly for us here in, in Ward 12 that haven't seen it. But uh, Boney is his name, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the uh, so if we take it, we traditionally things like affordable housing we've municipalities and councils have struggled to find money to support that and, and and we're hearing a lot more about the need for that sort of thing so if we have an area where maybe we don't have to have the Beaufort Towers out by Canada Olympic Park um, to decorate the side of the intersection near the highway and maybe we don't need the blue ring but maybe we really need affordable housing. So as a fiscally responsible and, and put the emphasis on responsible, we have a, some big infrastructure projects coming up. Um, mentioned again, the Green Line. It just, it just loops all back, doesn't it? Green um, Line Event Center, which we will be talking about later on in the interview. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so we have some big projects coming up. And, and I mentioned the Green Line particularly because it's an infrastructure type project rather than a, a building development type project. But the rather, there'd be a lot of money that's coming out of that Green Line project that would be directed towards questionable public art and whether or not we're managing it properly. And there, matter of fact, there have been some people around the council table that have advocated for lifting the cap so that even more gets spent on public art as a result of the Green Line project. I'm saying that maybe a more responsible decision and a fiscally responsible decision would be to take that money that we would put towards the public art project and, and, and it doesn't cancel all public art because we have separate line items for arts and culture that, that handles some public art and that sort yep. of thing. But specifically the, the part where it's a percentage of the infrastructure spending. And if we could take that and spend it on some social items like affordable housing and social supports that could go along with affordable housing, we're not taking a, you know, we're, we're benefiting that area that we've had a hard time um, fundraising for or finding the funds for before. It takes some of the stress off other parts of our budget and, and it takes it a, makes a wise use uh, of those funds so that when we do that big infrastructure project, people are going to say, well, geez, that's just going to help the people that are going to ride the train down in Ward 12 so they can get downtown. But no, but what if it's helping everybody 
because we've taken a percentage and we dedicated it towards affordable housing. So now we are helping the whole city with it. So, so that's just one idea I've been, I've been tossing around. One of the biggest things that this next council is going to have to tackle is recovery. Recovery from this pandemic, recovery from the oil and gas collapse. Calgary has been hurting for the last few years. We are looking at a recovery. I know when we are recording this, we are looking at a potential fourth wave or not fourth wave or however you want to address it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that the next council will have to deal with is and address is a recovery for everyone, not just a few, but for everyone. Everyone gets ahead. Everyone gets for uh, moves forward in a in a together fashion. I want to ask the question uh, before we get into a little bit more nitty gritty about it. How do you envision being fiscally responsible while ensuring everyone gets a fair shot at recovery? Because people are hurting out there right now. People are struggling. People are one paycheck away from losing their house. How do you envision being fiscally responsible while helping people? loops right back into what I was just talking about as one of the initiatives that we could do to really support that because that project is something that you know we're supposed to see shovels in the ground here very very shortly so in effect the timing on that is is almost perfect to help with the recovery and and if we put that in place that does help everybody move forward so you know, when we built that interchange at Canada Olympic Park and the Beaufort Towers went up with it, if you're a person that's struggling, if you're one missed payment away from losing your house or, or you got to make a decision between how, well, how much I'm going to eat and if I'm going to pay my power bill, then having a percentage of that infrastructure project go towards affordable housing and social supports in the communities is going to go a long ways, certainly further than somebody who has the ability to not worry about those things, whether or not, and they may not even like the looks of that public art as they're going out. So that's one step. There's so many, there's only so many things that at the municipal level we can do. Um, a, a real driver and some of the, uh, the th people that have been hit the hardest um, are small businesses and, and their employees, certainly in the pandemic. The, uh, some of the large corporations, the big chains, you know, they, they had the resources and they could, they could transition and, and go to a digital model. The, um, the small businesses, they didn't, they didn't have that ability. You know, they don't maybe have the expertise on their staff there. If you're a you know, sole owner and you're running the business and you've got five or 10 people working for you and you're selling pizzas or you're, um, you know, you have a small store that or you're somewhere in that entertainment food industry business because that got hit hard um, during COVID. We need to do things that are going to help out with those businesses. And, and, and for one, stay out of their way. Um, these are entrepreneurial people that know what to do. So as a city, we can support them, but even more importantly is stay out of their way. Um, you have to let your best players be your best players to use a bit of an overused sports analogy. And, and, and uh, the, the small businesses, we saw it a little bit. Uh, we started to see it when small business they can't they don't have the resources to have that huge online presence anyway and and have a very complicated thing where everything they have to offer is uh, done digitally on their website and they can bring in the traffic they rely on the people in their community to do it now unless you live as a customer within i'm going to say five blocks of that business where it's where it's easy to walk there um, and maybe carry home some goods or patronize them for their service. We need to get there somehow. And for the most part in Calgary, we we're a spread out city and it gets really cold here sometimes in the wintertime and the snow piles up two feet deep every once in a while at once. We drive. Um, you know, we have trucks and SUVs and cars and, and we drive to get to the to these businesses. Now if we don't have adequate parking 
loop back into parking. I don't want to harp on parking, but but if we take that away and, and we start to impact on that, it impacts on the ability of people to even patronize these businesses if it gets harder to do. And the city kind of un, sort of an aside sort of acknowledged that. And you saw some parking restrictions relaxed during COVID so that people could pick up orders and, and, and that sort of thing. And I think an acknowledgement of that by, by relaxing some of those guidelines really tells us a lot about some of the things we need to do to help those small businesses, which in turn help people um, to recover from COVID because those small businesses employ a lot of the people that got hurt the worst. So, um, One of the other areas that people are looking at right now when it comes to the next council is the issue around attraction and retention of our current population. Uh, we talked about youth at the beginning of the interview, but I want to bring it back to youth. Youth are leaving Calgary. Youth are going to Toronto, are going to uh, Vancouver, they're going to larger cities. Um, how do you envision retaining our youth population, but also as a side question, how do you envision retaining our population? Because on my street alone, in the last month, I've seen yard signs go up and I ask people where they're going. They're not staying in Calgary. They're leaving the city because they don't feel like their service for their value for taxes to the services that they're getting are adequate. And they don't feel like they're getting ahead in this city. How do we change that? How do we retain people and attract new people to the city? Well, a couple of things. And one, I really want to acknowledge something that, that you mentioned there. And I'm really glad that you mentioned it because it's not just retaining and attracting the youth, but it's everybody who works in Calgary because a lot of people who have been moving away, depending on where you define youth, where that cutoff is there, there's been a lot of professionals with fantastic knowledge and experience and expertise that could be helping to drive things um, for the city of Calgary have left and have gone. I've had neighbors that have moved overseas and they've moved to other municipalities uh, in Canada, uh, whether it be in other places in Western Canada. So uh, first of all, I wanna acknowledge how, how great it was that you mentioned it's not just the youth, but it's attracting people, I think attracting people and business in general to want to stay in, in Calgary. And when I moved to Calgary, Calgary was the place to go to. There was, there was a lot of optimism. And you know, it wasn't because of a massive boom in, in, in oil and gas. Uh, it was, we we're talking the mid 90s. We'd come out of the late 80s. There, was, there were some bad times in, in Calgary, but still there was that optimism there, that it was just, it was going to be the place to be because it had suffered through the worst and survived and there was that optimism going forward that you know it seems like it's stable and people are excited to be there and and and, and it's moving forward and in those days if, if if you go back and it's no secret i, I moved here from saskatchewan when i when when i went 25 years ago and <laughs> i'm an ontario boy so no uh, no judgment here i lived in saskatchewan <laughs> for a few years so uh, no judgment <laughs> You know, so so when I moved here, there, you know, at the time, it, it was kind of a, a, a common social joke. Last one out of the province, turn out the lights on your way out um, as you left Saskatchewan. And, and there was literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people that moved from the province and came out this way because they felt there was going to be some opportunity here. And if things were pretty stable, we were on the right track and there was optimism. And, and now we're not stable. We've seen things get out of control a little bit where, you know, we talked about residential taxes because, you know, that's impacting the, the vote, people who are going to be voting for the most part. But the non-residential taxes or the business taxes right now, you know, they, they, they went under a program to cap them at a 10% increase and, and cancel kind of gave themselves a pat on the back that, Hey, we're going to cap our, <laughs> once again, Chris is chuckling if you can see, but, but it's uh, funny because <laughs> how, do you, how, how do you say we're going to cap our increase at 10%? Like it just well, and, shake your head. 
Exactly. So if, if you're um, making decisions, if you're a decision maker and you're going to, you're a new startup or you are relocating your head offices because uh, because that's the way you grow business is with new business or we're with people re relocating and that's uh, that's how they come here um, and, and you're looking at where you want to do business and there's there's a bunch of factors that play in and and if your business is going to be and I'm air quoting capped uh, at, at a 10 percent increase each year well how long and I forget the math on that it's six or seven years for it to double and your taxes are going to double is that the kind of business environment you're likely to want to do business in. So, so all those things factor in. And if, when I talk about fiscal responsibility and, and, and keeping an eye on that and, and making responsible decisions, it just it goes out so much wider than just, hey, we got to cut out this program or we're going to cut this versus that. It has an impact on so many things. So, and I remember, you know, as I came here and, and ended up meeting a lot of other people that came here. And then there was a, a few years later and we had the story where Calgary became the second most popular municipality in Canada for head office locations only outside of Toronto. We're, we're never going to exceed Toronto. It's not going to happen. We, we don't, we're not as big a city. We're, and, and, and I'm okay that we're not Toronto. Don't get me wrong, Toronto. I'm, there's lots of nice people there, but we don't necessarily need to be Toronto. That, that's okay. So I think I think everyone who is listening to this who is from Calgary just said challenge accepted. We are going to beat uh, Toronto for the next five years. We it is our destiny now, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, at the time, I remember the news story, and it was that you know, we just took over from Montreal to be the second most popular uh, location for head offices in, in Canada. And you know, not all of that was oil and gas. Yeah, sure we have oil and gas and, it, and it's a big part of what we do. And I think that it's going to be a big part of what we do for, for, for many years to come. It, it's, it, it's not going away. We're, we can't flip the switch and, and make the, and make a change. I, I, way too, there's way too many things that are dependent on oil and gas. But I'll get off that for a second. And the, so we need to foster more of that. Um, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. You have lots of people come, geez, we've got to come up with a great idea how we're going to do this. We've got to come up with a new idea how we're going to do this. Sometimes we've got to rework the things we've already done because we've done it. We've done it before in the past. We've had great success with it before in the past. So rather than reinventing it, let's learn some lessons from things that we've done before, apply the positives, adjust the things that didn't work so well, and see if we can be successful in the next few years as we were a little bit while ago. Um, I, I, I literally just looked at the time and it shocked me that we have been talking for just over 40 minutes and uh, we were literally probably about three quarters of the way into the interview. and. It's great because usually I'm looking at the clock every five minutes going, okay, is it, if we hit that 40 minute mark now, can we wrap up? But I love this conversation. I love talking to people like yourself, Mike, who are willing to engage, but also expand on their ideas. I, I want, but I do, I am cautious of time because I want to make sure uh, you get back out on the campaign trail, but also for my listeners who usually tune out in the hour mark, I want to get my last few questions in if possible. Okay. Okay. Shoot. I want to talk about the green line. This is the big thing. And yep. as a Ward 12 candidate, this yep. is affecting your ward the most. The, yes. This is affecting your citizens the most. And I want to talk about it. Okay. We have been promised this green line for who knows how long. It seems like it's been an ongoing saga of when will they do it? Prime Minister Trudeau earlier in the summer announced that he was uh, the federal government will be putting in their money. The provincial government said they're putting their money in. The city is now getting ready, shovels in ground, hopefully this fall. Yes. I think there's a lot of people who are still going, okay, we understand that the announcements have been happening, but we'll wait to enjoy ourselves and be happy that it's actually getting off the ground until we see that photo of someone putting a shovel in the ground. Yes. As the next city councilor for Ward 12, how will you ensure that this project gets delivered on time and on budget but also finally happens. Continue to push and push for things that make sense. If you look back 
a lot of it was drug out, especially over the last couple of years with the Green Line, with how are we going to do it, where are we going to do it, and when are we going to do it? And there was there was some discussion there. I mean, the famous line that made the press all, all certainly all around the province was, you know, we were building the train to nowhere. Uh, <laughs> that 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 line came out. Um, certainly, you know, and it, it, it resonated with a lot of people. Uh, a few months ago, back when I first started the campaign, I had a suggestion and I said, if we really, because at that time it was nothing was approved yet. You know, we still hadn't heard from the government, the construction schedule, the city had sort of decided what they wanted to do it, but that hadn't been confirmed. It was at that up in the air type of yeah. uh, situation. And and I said, you know, if you really want to do this, let's do it in a way that just makes more sense. And let's build it from downtown. Let's, let's, what are we trying to accomplish with the Green Line? We're trying to move some people and connect some neighborhoods and connect some facilities and that sort of thing. So if we're going to do that, then we need to build it from downtown and build it out to that area, our ward. Uh, I know it sounds like it's very self-serving, but in, in our ward in Ward 12, that really needs that transit piece to connect to downtown. That would be the best way to do it. And, and so I put a proposal in place, let's connect the South and let's, let's go from the South and go to downtown and focus on that. And, and I put out a video on it and a lot of people watch that. And it just, I got, I get comments. I'm still getting comments today. Geez, that just, Mike, that made a lot of sense. We liked what you had to say there. And I believe that had we focused on a plan that made just a little bit more sense there that we probably could have gotten approval earlier and moved forward earlier. And we might not have been talking about this right now during this broadcast because the construction probably would have already started by now. But the green line, and we're not, we're not done talking about the green line yet because the part that's approved is phase one of the construction and, and they adjusted phase one so that it made more sense to go from downtown um, to part of Ward 12, in the last stop at Shepherd, 130th. But we still have that phase two that's open for discussion where right now the plan under phase two that isn't approved yet, by the way, um, is the bridge across the Bow River. At, at one time it was a tunnel, I got changed to a bridge. Finance wise, we were never going to afford a tunnel exactly yeah that was a bit of a pipe dream and not even really a dream because logistically i don't think it was a good plan either but the bridge across the bull river and then up center street and i can't remember it's like 10 blocks i think once you cross the river to get up to 16th avenue in that range i'm going to say 10 blocks is around figure once again i'll probably be fact checked on that that's okay it's somewhere around 10 blocks that is going to be expensive and we're going to disrupt traffic on Center Street because the current plan they're talking about, you know, cutting out a couple of lanes and having a train run up the center of Center Street. Center Street's not real wide right now as it is. If anybody's tried to drive down Center Street up, yeah, and once again. Yep, exactly. <laughs> I, I've hotting. driven it numerous times over the last two years of living in this city. And I can tell you, sometimes I, I wonder if people really know how to drive, but I will leave my comments. And for anyone who wants to submit comments to me about that comment, find me on Instagram. <laughs> so, so Center Street, we'll just say, can be a challenge already in terms of transit. Um, and we, but it is being served pretty well by public transit because we have some bus routes that run up and down Center Street that have good ridership on them. Um, they are being used quite a bit because it, it makes sense on that corridor, corridor to hop on a bus. If you live anywhere in there, you can walk out. The bus stops aren't real far between and you can get access to them and there is a lot of ridership and that was one of the arguments for taking the green line up center street to 16th avenue is hey we've got all this ridership i'm saying yeah exactly that's the best reason not to because we are already serving a large number of people with ridership and my opinion is that if we go with the train we're not going to get plus ridership on that we're probably going to anything we get plus on the train is probably going to come at the expense of the bus ridership and if you look at public transit as a whole in a little broader sense to pay for things i think you need to have plus ridership the more people that use it and pay a fee to use it we're going to pay off that project better so 
Um, how are you going to get plus ridership by taking away from a bus route that's already serving people pretty well up and down Center Street? And we'll talk about the businesses along Center Street in a second, but what if we could run that out to Seton in Ward 12, um, service one of the newest hospitals in the province, the South Health Camp campus. You can see that hospital from miles away, the size of that building. When you're coming from east or west or south of yep. the city, it, it's a highlight. You've seen it. Um, that's an employment center. And there's people, and there's been some great development. You know, the, the, the development around Seton, I've said this before in different things when we talk urban sprawl, we're not going to have time to get into that today. I know you're running short, but it's, Seton's like a shining example of a, of a community that was planned ahead of time with higher density, closer to the businesses and services and transit routes that were hoping to be there and that sort of thing. And then as you filter out and you get away from the walkability of those things, it starts to transition into lower density and more single family homes. That's a great thing. So it's already designed, the land is there. We don't have to take any land, it's, it's open. My, my video, I'm standing in the middle of a field where a train stop could be. Um, we could add plus ridership take cars off of Deerfoot, have greater environmental impact, not run the environmental risk of building a bridge over the Bow River again, because um, there are risks that, that come along. I, I, I so, got to ask the, the follow-up question here because we, we are in the process of hopefully having shovels and gram in 2021. Yep. Hopefully this thing will get off the ground. Yes. Are the people of Ward 12, are the residents of Ward 12 apathetic at the idea that they have been promised this for numerous years and we are just going to wait and see until it actually happens or are people actually encouraged by the federal provincial and municipal governments finally getting to the table and saying okay let's do it let's ha we have phase one in store let's get the shovels in ground there's some of both for okay. sure um the uh, and, and the federal and <laughs> let's be honest the federal announcement was made just previous to the launch of a federal election campaign and, what? And, <laughs> and, and shocker and and it was a uh, and it wasn't really an announcement of new money it was kind of reconfirming a commitment that was strategically made right before a federal election so i i i, I want to be cautious about giving them credit for authorizing the funds at the time they did because they had actually already said we were good to go federally it was yeah. more a hang up with the provincial budget and the, and the approval of funds so um yeah but yeah there are there are people that are both ways that geez you know when is it going to happen we've been talking about this i mean i've had people tell me i bought my house here and the people selling me i built a new house in this neighborhood i bought a condo i i bought you know i rented an apartment based on this is what's happening in the neighborhood. We were told so many times, this is what's going to happen. Um, it was a promise made to us and we're still waiting. So there's some skepticism there as well as, you know, moderated by the excitement that, yeah, it's, it looks like it's going to happen. So we are getting pretty excited about that because it has been so long. And if there's a chance that we could, now that we've seen that it's not locked in stone, and if we make a really good argument, a really good case for why it could come down to where it should, to where we were promised it would originally, then there's some optimism around that, that, yeah, maybe we can make that happen in a way that's going to benefit Ward 12 the best, but actually benefit the whole city because it is benefiting Ward 12. Um, okay. I want to, I want you to jump in the time machine here. Okay. I want you to, I want you to put yourself on October 19th. Yep. You are the newly designate councillor for Ward 12. The morning after the election, they have called that you are the new uh, councillor elect for Ward 12. What is priority number one for you on October 19th? Well, I'm going to kid around for just a second. I got to go out and pick up election signs because we got to have them down by a certain amount of time after the election. And, and, well, and first off. Thank you for being environmentally safe. Greatly appreciate it. But in, in pro, uh, policy and priority, what is number one? Um, budget. I mean, we're coming, we're going to have this election and we are going to, as soon as, because they go through a period of a few days when you are announced as a new council, they put you through an orientation. 
Uh, you've been through it probably, or yes. you know how people have. I've, oh. I've, I've done the being putting people through that uh, that fun that fun training session. Yes. So, so they, so they, they, they try and bring new counselors up to speed, which is going to be a task because we are going to have so many. Um, that's going to be quite the uh, uh, the class of 2021 uh, that's going through orientation um, come the second half of, of October this year. But right into that, we, we go into budget. So it is talking about things about where we're spending, what we're spending, and, and asking good questions about that. I think it, when, it, when it comes down to the, the budgetary and the discussion and the debate, it, it's asking good questions and, 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 and not just taking things always at face value for what's being presented to you, but asking questions about that. And how is that going to help? How is that going to, who's going to help? Who's going to benefit from that? Who might not benefit from that as much? Are we doing that in the best way possible? And, and asking some really intelligent questions because the better questions we ask, the better results we're going to have further. I, I, so, I so agree. Job one, October 19th is to dive into the budget. And um, a little shameless self-promotion here for a second, but uh, the, 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 that, that's where some, some, some of my experience comes in, in, in working in businesses of all sizes, from some of, the, some of the largest corporations in the country down to small, single-person businesses try, try, trying to, take, to, to make their way that I have that experience. And I think I have a lot to offer and to contribute to a conversation on that and be able to see it from a lot of different aspects rather than somebody that maybe has a lot to learn on the topic. That's going to be tough to come up totally to speed when we have literally a matter of days to make, to be making decisions on a four and a half billion dollar annual operating budget. I mean, that's a lot of money. Um, I think we have to be ready to go pitter patter. Let's get at her. So, um, I, I, as a business owner myself, and if I'm not mistaken, you are as well. Yes. As a business owner, you know that metrics have to be put into place to make sure you are successful. Uh, as a business owner, you set metrics out to say, okay, X, Y, and Z need to be done by X date, Y date, and Z date. I want to ask you, what metrics are you putting in place for yourself as the newly elected councillor for Ward 12, if you get the honour on October 18th to be elected? Mm -hmm. what, what metrics are you putting in place for the first 100 days to make sure what you're doing is good, but also you are connecting with your constituents of Ward 12? To make sure I'm having the conversations and getting involved where I thought that I could have the most amount of impact, and that was with the fiscal responsibility. So, by all because the budget is coming up, don't and I've used the word focus a lot uh, when I'm talking to campaign and and how in the past maybe we've lost some focus, and I think with all the noise and we use that term noise at the start of the conversation, there's going to be a lot of noise. Um, around the, the new council and, and budget discussions because they do come up so soon. The, a, a metric I guess I would use is to, to keep myself grounded and look back, you know, don't shut down my website on October 18th and my blog and my ideas and what I've been telling people and all the interviews I've done and the ideas I had and what I felt were priorities. If, if I were lucky enough that people they resonate if it, res if it resonated with them and, and, and they thought that, yeah, that's something we need to focus on. Then as a representative, I need to look back and go, okay, that's what we need to focus on because that's what we talked about. Let's, let's not lose focus and get distracted, but keep focused on those things and, and make sure you're representing the people that elected you and, and voted you in and, and keep doing that. And, and use that as a measuring stick. Okay, am I represented? Um, for those that have talked to me before, I've, I've sometimes gone on a little rant about the difference between leading and representing. And I think far too often in politics, and as we've had people that have been politicians and maybe wanted 
these politicians when they were a kid and, and growing up that they're focused on leadership and you hear that so much during elections and you know and we're getting it kind of doubly so now in in the midst of uh, a federal election and so you hear leadership and, and the word leader 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 well leader almost implies that people are following uh, when you mention leader whereas i think in particular at the municipal level representatives need to focus on that not so much leading as representing you are elected to represent the people of your ward and and their best interests and their ideas and i think you really need to stay grounded and stay focused on that focus on being a representative not necessarily a leader um, my last question before we wrap up here is if elected um i will i will be honest with every candidate who is on the show there is no acclamations this time. No. You, you will not get 100% of the vote. You will have to represent everyone, people who vote for you, people who don't. How will you guarantee to the people who don't vote for you that their voices will be heard? Because I talk to people across the city and they uh, the time and time again, I hear, I don't feel my voice is being heard because I had X political sign on my lawn. How do you ensure that people do feel like they're being heard if they don't vote for you on October 18th, Mike? By, by genuinely listening and acknowledge that you're listening to them. So many times when people have a concern and they want to have it addressed, they're contacting the, their counselor offices where they start typically. And, and I've heard from so many people already that you know, they have an assistant or they're, you know, it, and I remember in an interview with Shane Keating at one time that he said, you know, people were upset that they never got a call back from him because they really wanted to talk to him and see how he felt about it. And they felt that they weren't being heard or they wasn't understood because he wasn't directly involved. My goal as a representative is to represent people. And if that inquiry comes in, get back to them with my, by myself with a quick note. You know, maybe something, hey, I understand that and I get what you're doing and here's, what, here's how I'd like to address and that I'm gonna have some people help me with that. So you might hear back from, from some other staff on that, but I understand what you're saying and I, I'd, I'd like to move forward on that and take that into account. But that personal contact with the representative, when, cause you hear it so many times where somebody gets elected and then they never hear from them again. And I think that leads to some of the frustration uh, that you were mentioning. So staying true to the people that elected you and voted you, and even those that didn't, and listening to them and remembering that you represent 90,000 people-ish, roughly, in the ward. And that is your job, to represent 90,000 people, not just the people that voted for you, and try and help as many people as you can make the best decisions that will impact and improve the lives of as many people as possible in the ward. That's the best thing I think a person could do. And I appreciate your honesty and transparency with that because we need people like yourself who are willing to get back and talk to people because politicians are there to represent all of us, not just the people who we who vote for them. Um, I want you to take two minutes, take as long as you want. Talk to the people of Ward 12 who are listening to this right now. Why should you be their next city councillor for Ward 12? I don't even think I'm going to take two minutes. I'll try and take one minute or less because if you give me two minutes, I'll probably take five. Uh, the... So you'll take one and you'll do three? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think a lot of it just comes back is just to wrap up some of the things we talked about. Um, some of the words I've used to describe my campaign is responsible, respectful representation and to provide a voice of reason on city council. Um, so that responsible, trying your best to make good decisions that are gonna benefit more people rather than focused on one's own agenda and pushing an issue, being responsible for people, being respectful, um, not only respecting the taxpayers, but everybody living in the ward, whether they're directly paying property tax or not, um, showing respect for other city council members. We didn't really talk about that, but it's been a bit of a gong show over the last few years with people, you know, 
this is professionals. You ever notice how we don't use the word dignitary anymore? When we're referring <laughs> to the table? Um, they, at bringing that respect back in and just because you and I see, maybe how are coming from a different point of view. That doesn't mean I can't respect your opinion. We can debate it. If it breaks down to name calling, like we've seen, it's been well publicized here in the city of Calgary. Usually if you just result to calling somebody a name on council, it's because you've run out of things to talk about in a constructive manner. You've lost the power for debate, but you don't want to lose. So you just start calling people names. I, I think we deserve better than that um, as the people of Calgary. Um, and, rep, and I, I already talked about focus on representation. And because I have some experience and I really like to focus on process and, and why we're doing things, what are the goals and what are we achieving? And, and are we gonna achieve that? And, and who are we gonna, and how are we gonna achieve and how are we gonna measure that achievement? Um, that's where that voice of reason comes in. And maybe if we can just all take a breath and work in the same direction, I think it's more important than ever to have that voice of reason on city council with the amount of change we're going to see. And I hope that if elected, I'm able to bring that and, and move us forward in a constructive, responsible, respectful manner. Um, I, I want to just take a moment here and address that, what you just said about the name calling. It is a issue. It is an issue that people have been talking about across the city. And I hope this, the next 15 people who get elected on October 18th, stop it for the sake of the people of Calgary, but also stop it for the sake of our, our um, image on the Canadian stage. Uh, thank you so much for addressing that. Um, in order to get to October 19th, in order to get to your first 100 days, you need to be elected. While we have spent the last hour and 10 minutes talking about issues, People of Ward 12 may have other issues that they want to address. How can people reach out to your campaign? How can people get in touch with you and ask the questions that need to be asked from their perspective on what they're facing today? Best way is on my website, michaelvalley.ca. There's forms on there you can fill out. There is email on there that comes direct. It doesn't go to a campaign manager or another politician. If you write an email, it comes directly to me. I see it first. And I do my best to get back to you as fast as possible, as rapidly as possible. And there's a phone number on there too. And it rings through to this phone right there. Um, <laughs> you're, you're not going to get shuffled off. If you have to leave a brief message, do that. I'll get back to you as soon as I can, because I might have been in an interview talking to a really great guy. So I just, you know, every once in a while, <laughs> things come up, but I will return your call. Um, for my listeners and to my viewers, you know what I'm about to say. Um, and I've said this on every single interview, every single show for this series. Get out, vote. If you do not vote in this election, I do not want to see you on Twitter. I do not want to see you on Facebook complaining that your, your voice wasn't heard or something is going wrong at City Hall. This is the city. This is the future of our city. We are voting on on October 18th. Get out, get informed, learn about the candidates, vote for the person who best represents your values and your morals. And the best I'll absolutely the double you on that, Chris. I, I love that you said that. And, you know, do your research. It takes you to go and vote. It's going to take you probably an hour. By the time you get down to the bowling station, it, it's an hour out of your life to vote. Spend at least that much time researching before you do it or before you go through the process of requesting a mail-in ballot or, or anything like that. You know, if you go and ask some good questions, read between the lines, go behind the scenes, do some research. Don't always take at face value what I or anybody else that's running an election tells you, because if all you did was read through their websites real quick, you'd have the choice of dozens of great people to choose from. And I would go, you know, do your research, find out who you think is going to best represent you and make a well-informed, well-educated decision about who you're voting for. If it turns out in Word 12 that you do that and you're really comfortable and it turns out not to be me, I'm cool with that as long as you are cool with the, that you've decided that you've done your research and your education and you're going to vote somewhere else. I'm happy. I'm excited. It means everybody was well engaged. 
and they made who they thought was a better, they made the best decision they thought they could. Could not have said it better myself, Mike. Um, again, everyone, for anyone who's looking for Mike's information, contact information, website, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the whole kit and caboodle social media, the links are in the show notes. For those who are listening audio version, please uh, go back to the main screen and look for the uh, websites at the bottom of your uh, show notes. And those who are watching via YouTube, just scroll down a bit and you will see Mike's website, Instagram, social media pages there as well. Mike, I want to thank you so much for this. Um, this has been an honor and a pleasure and I've gotten a lot out of you and I wish you all the best on the 18th because uh, I believe we need people like you in uh, uh, politics and I, I believe we need people like you who are authentic running in elections like this so thank you so much thank you chris really appreciate the opportunity let's talk again after the election 100 days uh, 100 days i will hold you to that uh, issue <laughs>